So after seven out of a total of ten episodes, Star Trek Picard has finally got me completely on board. Yeah, um, I, I am. I'm completely in. Star Trek Picard, episode seven, Nepenthe, was great. It was wonderful. It was probably my favorite episode of the series so far. And it did everything it needed to do. It advanced the story, it advanced the characters, and it showed the theme without having to belabor it by saying it over and over and over again. I'm in. I'm in. But why did it take you seven episodes to get here? This should have happened much sooner. Let's talk about Star Trek Picard on today's episode of Project Shadow. Hello everyone, how are you doing today? My name's Charlie, you might know me better as sci-fi fantasy writer C.E. Dorset, and... Yeah, I want to talk about Star Trek Picard because it's Monday and I watch it on Thursday and then I think about it on Friday and then we talk about it on Monday because th- th- that's the speed at which I turn things around sometimes. That's like warp speed for me. Yeah. But before we get into all that, if you haven't already, please do take a moment to rate this podcast and whatever app you're listening to me on. It really does help out a lot. It tells the algorithm to share the podcast with more people, and the more people that listen, the bigger the community. The bigger the community, the better the chance we have of actually communicating with each other. And that is, after all, why I do this podcast in the first place. Thank you to everyone who has already done that. So, any of you who have been listening to my rocky, rocky road of (laughs) coming to terms with Star Trek Picard being the show that Star Trek Picard is... And don't, don't don't get me wrong, there's still some things that I have issues with, but it finally crystallized everything into a form that I can recognize and go, oh, that's what you are. I thought you were going to be this other thing, and you're this thing, and oh, that's why you did that and that and that and that. And... <clears throat> And while there are some things I really wish they hadn't done, I I can see it in the full context of what it is they're trying to do. I do think that this is a show that the show writers kind of didn't understand wasn't going to be binged initially. Because it there's nothing wrong with a TV show watching like a book reads. And that's a structure that works fairly well with bingeable media. Uh, there, there are quite a few shows that do this well. The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, I think, does this really, really, really well, where you can see the beats play out episode to episode to episode, because they know it's all coming out at once. And so you can sit there with it. You don't have to wait a week to find out why they made some of the decisions that they made. The biggest problem with this show, and I don't know if this is a problem with me or with it, is that since I do have to wait a week between episodes, I have time to sit around and ask myself, why are you doing that? Why did you do that? What was the point of introducing Dodge in the way you did? What's the point of doing oh, a thousand things? Treating Rafi the way you've treated Rafi. Which, as you know, is one of my biggest gripes about this show. And then, and then, this episode comes about and basically goes, oh, he- here's why we did all that. This is the reason. Here it is. And I go, oh. Okay. Well, I understand that now, but I bet a lot of people checked out before they got this far because you were making some fairly incomprehensible decisions. And this has been an, uh, this has been a problem with Star Trek since it came back. 
from Discovery Season 1, and also in Season 2, they did this a lot, where they made incomprehensible decisions that, yes, at a certain point, with hindsight, they make sense, but you have to make it through going, okay, this is actually going to pay off in a reasonable and interesting way. And Discovery has kind of burn me out that that that's probably not what's going to happen because they're just going to be responding to internet trolls as early and often as they possibly can. And it's just going to be a reply thread. And don't get me wrong. I really like a lot of things about discovery, but we'll have to see if the re reboot that is happening in season three pays off. This show has felt like that a lot, like they were trying to pre butt a lot of the things that people like me were going to say, or that people, especially the trollish side of fandom, were going to say about the show. And they didn't take the time that they needed to do <clears throat> to lay the groundwork, to give us a reason to actually feel anything about a lot of the characters they did. Dr. Girardi, I think, is the best example of this. The way they have treated Agnes Girardi is disgraceful. Because we have no reason to care for her. We don't. Unless you just count our basic fellow feeling, because she's human, we're human, humans, rah-rah. That's it. That's all we have. We meet her as an information dump. She returns as a convenient plot device. She continues as a convenient plot device. And then does the things that we're going to have to talk about later in spoilers in this episode. And between this and her previous actions, we're supposed to have feels. But we never got to know her. The same is true with Elnor. Elnor has made decisions, and we're meant to have feels about them. But I know so little about Elnor that it's hard for me to have that connection with the character that I need to have. And I can say the same thing with Rios. Now, Ravi, we've gotten a little bit more about, and I'm not counting any of the exterior media, whether it's a book or a comic or what have you, those don't count because most people don't read those. If it's not in the text, it didn't happen. So even if it is in the comics or the books or any of the other surrounding media that they want us to pay for, it has to be referenced in the core media or it didn't happen. We'll talk about that later when we talk about the novelization of The Rise of Skywalker. To be continued. Picard, they've done a better job showing us his story, and the same with Soji. Understanding where these characters are coming from and why it is they're doing the incomprehensible sometimes things that they're doing. But at least, finally, we have a crystallization of the series. And I, I keep using that word because I feel like this is the point where our super-saturated fluid finally got a seed crystal in it and everything that they've done finally makes sense. I don't know if that's for the better or for the worse, but it finally makes sense. Now, they're still relying on a lot of cheap, very cheap ploys to get us there. The use of Echeb, Hugh, Seven of Nine, and in this episode which I don't think it's a spoiler because it's all over. Like, you can't load the episode to watch without realizing that Deanna and Riker are going to be in this episode. So, yeah. And yet again, they are relying on a lot of nostalgia cues for us to understand their backstory because we haven't caught up with them since the end of Nemesis. And yeah, we get a little explanation of what's happened to them in the interim, but a lot of the meaning is carried to the fan via names, 
that means something. And if you're not, I really, because I, I can't put myself in the mindset of somebody who's not a huge Star Trek fan. And like this, I don't consider this a spoiler. We know that they have a kid because she's in the first trailer they ever released for the show. But they named the kid Kestra. And that name has meaning because I'm a huge fan of The Next Generation and I know who Kestra was. If you are new to the series, if this is your first Star Trek series and you have no idea who Kestra is, does that name mean anything to you? Does the name Thad mean anything to you? Does that inform your understanding of the situation? No, because you don't understand the backstory because it's never touched on, it's never mentioned in the episode itself. And since you don't know that backstory, you don't have that extra information coming in. And so I wonder how some of those story beats work in absence of that extended fandom. Honestly, I think I've said all that I can without going into spoilers. So if you have not seen Star Trek Picard Episode 7, Nepenthe, and you don't want to be spoiled, go watch it, come back, we'll talk. All right? Spoilers are incoming in 5, 4, 3, Two, one. You have been warned. Okay, so this episode opens up with our characters going to Nepenthe, a planet that, as soon as I heard the name of it, I just turned to my husband and said, this planet has curative properties, because that's why you use the word Nepenthe. And the planet has curative properties. Not only does it have curative properties, but our characters, which I don't know if I'm supposed to call her Deanna Troy or Diana Riker, because I don't know if she took her husband's name, it is the 24th century, so I, d I don't know. But Will and Deanna moved here because their son Thad got an illness that was eminently treatable, but the cure had to, for some reason, be grown in a positronic matrix, and because of the events on Mars, it was illegal to create a positronic matrix. And they couldn't find an outside species that was doing that for some reason, because there's no such thing as a black market. I, I'm not going into that, but they moved there and that died and it's sad. It's sad. So, well, that gives them a connection to everything else beyond their connection to data because, okay, fine, fine. I, I do like this bit of backstory, not because of the connection to all of the ramifications of there not being AIs, because I think that Oh, that's the biggest plot stretch that they put into this episode, but okay, I'm fine with it. I do like how it affected the character of Deanna Troy, and you can see how she is and is not her mother, Loaxana. Like, you can see how this changed her because she lost her son. She now understands what her mother went through because her mother lost her first child. Kestra, which, by the way, is the name of Will and Deanna's daughter. Which is why I said, if you don't know who Kestra is, that name doesn't mean anything to you. But as soon as I f found out that her name was Kestra, I was like, oh, she has a sibling that died. And of course, she had a sibling that died. So, okay, yeah. It's, it's predictable, but uh, okay. It's predictable in that good way that you have to know the lore, you have to know the setting. Okay, I'm, fi I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. But that wonderful line where she says to Picard, when Deanna says to Picard, I'm not as brave as I used to be. And he says, good, that means you're wiser. I love that because she used to be able to live her life kind of recklessly because she didn't have a husband, somebody in her life that relied on her. And she didn't have children, dependents that literally rely on her for their care, well-being, everything. And that does change a person. And I like the way that it affected Riker and Troy. I, I do. I, th I think it works, and I'm fine with it. And I love their daughter, Kestra. Oh man, Kestra is such a great character. And honestly, if they did a cartoon spinoff or a live-action spinoff that's just her running through the woods, using her dead brother's 
Khan Langs and can can I just say how cool it is that Khan Langs are this integral to Star Trek now? I, I, I love that as somebody who does Khan Lang. But yeah, okay. <clears throat> I'm fine. I'm good. I'm good. And the relationship between Soji and Kestra was cute, and I loved it, and it worked really, really well. I do feel like they became fast friends, but I'm, I'm, we don't know exactly how long it took the Serena, the La Serena, to get there. We don't know how long exactly Picard was there. It kind of feels like it happened like in a day, but we know that they were trying to shake the Romulan for a while, so I, I don't know. It took some time. Because this is one of the weird things about this episode is, what what is your ETA? It's the same amount of time as it was I told you last time. Click. That doesn't tell us the audience. So is he going to be there in a day? Is he going to be there in an hour? Did it take a week? Have you been there for a month? We don't know. Uh, anyway. Because <laughs> all we get to see, really, is that they have one meal. So it feels like they were only there for a couple hours. But, yeah, who knows? I'm, I'm not going to... We do see Soji wake up at one point, so maybe that was the next day. They spent the night. I, I, I don't know. I just don't know. But it, again, it doesn't matter. Because the, the key to this entire series and the key to all of this comes in two moments. One given by Rafi and the other given by Troy. And I'm going to start with Troy because Troy does this wonderful thing where she, she just puts Picard in his place. This is something she's done a couple times over the course of the series, and I love it because very few people are willing to stand up to Jean-Luc. But she does. And just goes, look, it may be laughable to you, but you're not looking at the world from her point of view. And that is the point, isn't it? JL has not been looking at how the events that have transpired have affected anyone else except him. And there's nothing wrong with that. He grows out of it. He, he sees the error of his ways, and he needed to see the errors of his ways. But it's because he was dealing with his own trauma. He was dealing with his own problem. His failure to save more Romulans and not to be able to keep his word destroyed him. He was the great Jean-Luc Picard. He had built himself up into the state of such abject hubris that when he was knocked down, he just retreated to Chateau Picard and waited to die. That's it. That's, that's all he did. And he's having to learn how to reconnect with the world again. And that's what's wrong with him. And she just lays that out right in front of him, and he realizes, oh man, I've been a jerk. I've been a bad person. I need to be better. And he is better. And we'll see if that sticks. Because I, I kind of want to see this show, especially this season, as kind of the redemption of Jean-Luc Picard. And I feel like that's what they're going for. But the real key to this series and to everything that they've done so far is this wonderful interplay between... Uh, Agnes Girardi, you know, the character I love so much, and Raffi, where Agnes says, you're a good person. And Raffi responds with this wonderful line, no, I'm not, I'm a broken person. But in a pinch, I can cobble un together enough of a good person to make do. Oh, that's it. That's it. Because we're all broken people. Everyone is broken in some way, shape, or form. Life has kicked us all in the teeth in some way, at some time, and caused us to break. And if you're one of the blessed few that that's not happened to, thank your lucky stars, thank the angels that guard you, whatever it is in your worldview that keeps you safe, thank it. Thank it now. Because so few escape from this life unscathed. But that's it. That's it. That's what we have to do. We have to be able to cobble together enough of a good person 
to make do. And there you are. There's the link. There's the key, I hope, that will unlock everything else that happens in the show. It will explain how Narek is going to end up sacrificing himself for Soji, because you know that's going to happen, because it's the predictable outcome, and his character has been absolutely nothing if not predictable. But it's also going to explain the AI and the way we're eventually going to defeat the AI. There is an evil AI out there. It's going to destroy the world because Commodore O mind melded with Girardi and showed it to her because reasons. Somebody time traveled. Time travel. Ugh, I hate, <laughs> I hate it when the store. Oh, this is the worst thing that they do in these Star Treks is somebody has to have either time traveled for the story to make sense or is from an alternate parallel universe and Dang it, just stop it and tell human freaking stories. Anywho. <laughs> yeah, we need to cobble together enough to get, of a good person to get by. And that's the moral of the story. And I feel even more satisfied in that because the name of the next episode is Broken Pieces. And apparently they're going to learn why Mars was attacked. They're going to learn that Dr. Girardi killed... Maddox and Elnor is going to go just kill switch engaged. I don't know. He's going to go crazy on the board cube because that's the description of the episode. So I can't wait for that. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I I'm so excited about this because they finally gave a thesis statement that's supposed to come like in the first episode, but they waited because they, they didn't read. I just want to send the writer's rooms copies of Save the Cat because it will fix so many of the problems with their shows. Because if in episode one, somebody had made a sentence, statement, something like that, I would have locked in sooner. But no, we had to wait till episode seven of ten. Anywho, if you enjoyed this episode, please do share it and like it and rate it and all those things. It really does help out a lot. If you have any questions, comments, or topics you'd like to hear discussed on the show, in the show notes, you'll find a link to the voice message system. Keep it short, keep it clean so I can use it. I would love to hear from you. If you'd rather hit me up on social media, I am C Dorset on both Twitter and Instagram, and you can find links to everything that I do over at projectshadow.com. Ah, <sighs> yeah. Alrighty. If you've got a buck that you can pass my way and help the project to grow and pay bills and all those wonderful things, you'll find a link to both my Patreon and the listener support in the show notes. Thank you to everyone who already does that. If you don't have any money right now or you don't feel like giving, remember, sharing the podcast helps so much because I'm about to have to spend a bunch of money on ads because if I don't spend ads, people don't see things because... That's that's the world we live in. So most of my income right now that doesn't go to bills is going to pay for ads so that people can hear about the show. So, yeah. Anywho, thank you to everybody who listens. You all mean the world to me. Until next time, don't forget to have the fun. Bye. <laughs>